Okay, we are about to arrive on set for the first time. Yeah, I've got the doctor. <laughs> okay, perfect. Casper's here over there talking to uh, Jacob, so maybe you can get a couple of shots. This is dope. Make sure to get good shots of all this stuff. It's a million dollar look for absolutely nothing. And here's the cherry. They say it's haunted. But what better place to film a ghost movie than in a haunted hotel, right? Let me know if you need anything. And action! I'll be back. I promise. And cut. We got it. Yeah, we're good. Great. Cool. Thank you, Mr. Van Dean. I'll take that. Yeah, this place is really creepy. surreal. Can you tell us um, where did the idea for this film come from? The idea really came from a couple of different places. One some of my own experiences working in the independent film industry and working, you know, with modest budgets and, and sometimes the things that were required to do uh, in order to realize a film or, or things that distributors demand of us. And so there's a lot of that kind of inside baseball stuff going mm -hmm. on, but also just the thought that how far are people willing to go for success? What are they willing to do? to achieve success and uh, money and fame and everything that comes with it. So I, I don't want to give too much away for those people that haven't seen it yet, but uh, w would you be willing to make that kind of, of sacrifice to get everything that you wanted? Not everything, no. <laughs> Especially the way it unfolds in this movie, no. Um, can you tell me something about the location? Because it was it was kind of unique. It's, it wasn't run down, and it was still functional, but yet it was still kind of creepy. Yeah. Originally, the film was written to be in a hospital. Mm -hmm. And I looked all over, and I couldn't find a hospital that was right or where I knew anybody because, you know, you need help on these, on these kinds of movies. You need help locally, and you need help financially, and you need people to work for free, and, you know, you need everything you can get. So... I just wasn't finding that. And then I found, I went back to Jefferson City, Missouri, where I had shot a film back in 2012. And I went back to my contacts there and just asked them, do you have any other cool locations that are closed down that I can get into and, and, and make a movie in? And they said, well, we have this hotel that recently closed. And I looked at some pictures of it, and it was okay from what I saw, and I quickly dismissed it. And then I later went back and I dug deeper into the pictures and that's when I saw this big double staircase and, and saw that it really was this kind of grand property. Uh, so it was perfect for us. Uh, was it still a functioning place or was it closed down for the no, season? It, no, it had been recently closed down and scheduled for demolition in fact. So oh. the, the cool thing was that they said to us, we really don't care much what you do in it because we're going to be tearing it down anyway. So that was a huge plus that, you know, we could splatter blood on the walls and, and not worry about ruining anything. Was it fully furnished when you got there, or did you still have to set dress it? No, it, it, we walked in, and it was as if the maids had made up the room, and everyone then just decided to shut it down and leave and, and lock the door behind them. So literally everything was made up. Um, not all the rooms were, and some of the rooms were in pretty – bad disrepair. They even used the hotel for SWAT training or firefighter training. So a lot of the doors were broken in and broken down. Um, so it was a really interesting location. Was it, was there really much that you would have to do to make the place a little bit more eerie or was it just that as is state pretty much accomplished what you were looking for? Honestly, nothing. We, we went into the location and we had to clean it up a little bit because there was some storage here and there. And then we had to make it look like a movie set. Mm -hmm. um, by putting equipment around and lights, and that was about it. We just, you know, it was more, dressing it was more a matter of removing things. 
when you're when you're filming a, a movie within a movie or a production within a movie, how difficult is that? Is that something that you really have to plan out, or is that basically you're just showing what's behind what's behind the camera and makes it a little bit easier? No, actually, it makes it kind of difficult because you need sort of you need two sets of film making gear. So mm-hmm. that's where it becomes just a little more tricky and expensive. And when you've got a limited budget, it's hard to create a film set that looks kind of big. Uh, and at the same time, we need our own equipment to shoot that film set. So it, it, it actually presents some problems. Um, mm-hmm. But then at the same time, it's it's a little easier because we also never had to worry about gear being in the shot or a C-stand in the shot or anything like that. It all worked perfectly for us. You essentially have two stars in the movie. You have Casper playing Casper, and then you have your star of the actual film itself, who's always behind the camera. How do you get a performance out of a guy that you rarely see in front of the camera? Yeah, Daniel's part was interesting because what he did was, you know, he wasn't actually shooting the movie within the movie. Mm-hmm. He 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 was he was always trailing behind our cameraman. Mm-hmm. So it was always a little bit cumbersome because we have these long shots of running down hallways and going into rooms and maneuvering through this labyrinth of a of a hotel. And we always had to have our lead character Daniel trailing right behind our camera. Mm-hmm. So it just always created another body in there and, and, and just made the choreography always a little bit more challenging. Are there any uh, particular spots within that hotel that you really liked filming at, like um, either either an area that's really creepy or an area that made it very advantageous to film in? Uh, I was always drawn to the bar. It was just mm-hmm. it, uh, the stories that I was told that every every politician had held some event in that bar at some point, and uh, it, it was just a real common gathering place for the community. And I tend, I, I had a tendency to go in there and use it just kind of as my office, and um, <laughs> and it was just kind of neat with a big grand piano in it. And uh, again, everything was just sort of left as is. So. I enjoyed working in the bar, and then um, that was about it. The other, I mean, one of the big problems with the location was that it was August in Missouri, and there was no air, there was no functioning air conditioning in the hotel. Ooh. And on top of that, we had a lot of rooms that had windows that had been boarded over, so nobody would enter the property. Mm-hmm. So there were times in there where you know it was well over a hundred degrees inside, and, and not the most comfortable conditions to work in um in fact the bar was one of the few places that had air conditioning that's probably why i liked it so much (laughs) um when you had casper on set were you just did you just tell him to just be yourself or did you kind of have to structure his uh his role casper and i met before we ever were on location in fact before he was ever even cast because i just wanted to make sure that he was willing to play along and he was willing to play kind of a heightened version of himself or sort of a, a jerk version of himself. And he loved the idea. He was, he was totally had a sense of humor about it and he was completely on board. So I just kind of let him roll with what that version looked like. What, you know, I wrote the words, but the physicality and everything that he came up with to be a little more pompous and arrogant and disinterested was all just sort of his invention. Um, was there anything that you that you had in the script that you didn't get to film, or did you get everything that you that you wanted to? I think it was. I pretty much got everything I, I wanted to. I was hampered once in a while just by the fact that this was a property that was about to be closed down. Mm-hmm. In fact, we had to go back and shoot a couple additional scenes because once I cut the movie, I was just a little bit short and. I think it was because of these very long takes that we did. It just didn't quite live up to the rule of thumb of a page per minute in the mm-hmm. script. So I found myself a, a little short, and I went back. Now, when I went back, they had completely cut the power to the property. There was nothing left, and there was not much I could do, so I designed a scene then to be completely filmed in night vision. And I think it actually worked out in our favor. 
Oh, that and was the the, uh, the stairwell scene, right? The long walk, the long walk through wow. down the lower kitchen, out through the ballroom. I mean, it's this really long walk, all done completely in the dark, uh, with a with literally with night vision with a night vision camera. And in fact, that was one of the things I didn't want to do in this movie. I didn't want to do the fake night vision, mm-hmm. where you just turn the footage green and you know. So yeah. any any of the night vision we actually shot in dark with night vision cameras. Uh, would you want to would you want to go through this experience again with shooting in this kind of location, or is it kind of a one and done? No, it was a lot of fun. And in fact, the first movie I shot in Missouri was in uh, it was at Missouri State Penitentiary, which is a decommissioned prison mm-hmm. um, from the 1800s. And I, I I have two other projects I want to go and shoot there. They're not horror; they're actual um, true stories. Mm-hmm. But um, I love the locations in in Jefferson City, Missouri. It's, it's, there's so much production value there, and they're so accommodating with with filmmakers. Yeah, we used to have that luxury here in Florida until they took away all the tax benefits for filmmakers. So now everyone's just leaving, and we have so many great historic locations. Yeah, it's the same thing in in Missouri. There there actually is no tax incentive, and it's an ongoing problem. So they look for other ways to help lure filmmakers. And and when you're on a budget like ours, we're you know, the tax incentives aren't going to help us all that much, but the free locations mm-hmm. do help us. So, uh, get, you know, getting these multi-million dollar locations is, is just priceless to us. Uh, when is uh, when is the film coming out for people that want to uh, either see it in theaters or uh, get it on demand? Uh, it, it, it has a wide VOD uh, release July 10th. Okay. Is that going to be um, iTunes, Amazon? Google? Yeah, they, you know, honestly, they haven't told me exactly. They ah. just said they just said nationwide VOD, so it's it's probably all of those everywhere. Things. Yeah. <laughs> okay. On no problem. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any uh, any words of wisdom for filmmakers that are looking to to do what you do to uh, to either break into the business or if they have a career they're trying to trying to manage it along? So I know a lot of uh, a lot of our our viewers are are, car, are aspiring filmmakers, and they just they they don't know what to do. They're kind of stuck in that rut. Like, am I going to stay on YouTube and make just YouTube videos, or can I make that push for Hollywood? Right. Yeah. It, you know, it's it's the industry has changed so much in the in the past ten fifteen years, and it's continuing to change um, because everything is so accessible now. Anybody can pick up a 4K camera and shoot something and they can edit it and they can put it on iTunes. And and so that's a really good thing, but it's also a really bad thing because it's created this glut of, of material, this, this glut of movies. So the distributors, they, they don't have to really pay much now. They don't have to pay anything now. They, um, so that part's made it a little more difficult for the filmmaker. But my mm-hmm. advice always for the young filmmakers is, learn the craft. And that's the other problem with everything being so accessible right now is that there's no more, um, you don't in, you don't do an internship anymore. You, you don't have a mentor anymore. You just pick up your iPhone and you pick up a 4K camera or any HD camera and you just say, well, I'm just going to go shoot something. And that's great. And that's empowering. Mm-hmm. But we have a generation now where people aren't having to come up through the ranks and actually learn storytelling and framing and all the things that um, you know that we had to learn before. Yeah, there's there's kind of like a lack of respect. In- yeah, it's just it's just oh well, I can do that. Anybody can do that. Well, not really. I mean, there is you know I've got 33 years in the, in the industry, and I was fortunate enough to work in special effects before I started in post production and filmmaking and all that. And and so you know back in the 90s, it was the heyday of special effects. So I had mm-hmm. the opportunity to watch Steven Spielberg work and watch Harold Ramis work and watch all these guys and, and learn and absorb it all. Um, so I think that's definitely kind of missing right now. So yeah, my advice always is just be good, learn to be good, learn the craft. Don't, don't just pick up a camera and do it, but try to really learn the craft. All right. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, for taking, taking the time out to uh, talk to me today. I really appreciate it. And of course I, I screened the, uh, I screened the film a couple of weeks ago and <laughs> I had a good time, especially when good. Casper was being very kind of standoffish. <laughs> yeah, which is funny because it's it's the complete opposite of Casper. He's he's just like he truly is one of the nicest 
people I've ever worked with, and, and he was nothing but cordial on set, and he was everybody's cheerleader, and he just made the whole environment just really, really fun. And and actually, it was a funny thing because there were a lot of weird, spooky coincidences that kept happening, mm-hmm. things that were written into the script that actually ended up manifesting themselves when we were shooting. And one of them was that kind of running gag with Casper of, oh, stay out of his way. He's in a pissy mood right now because we, we messed up his flight. Well, he almost didn't make it to Missouri because his flight ended up getting so messed up. Oh. And um, he ended up being diverted two hours away, and we had to send a driver out in the middle of the night to get him. And, 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 and by the time he showed up on set, I didn't know what I was going to be facing, but he couldn't have been any nicer about it. <laughs> well, you, you definitely – Definitely lucked out with having him because yeah, just <laughs> he he made the movie even though yeah, even though he doesn't he's not he's not the main focus of the movie he was just he added that something to it that made it very very tangible and very easy to latch on to so yeah I think so too. I, yeah. I appreciate it as a as a fan of horror and I, good, I good. thank you very much for making the viewing experience easy <laughs> good you're very welcome <laughs> all right Andrew thank you very much I okay. hope you have yourself a good day. You too. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.